many of you have a pet with a chronic debilitating disease? Today, I want to show you how these two, a disease in humans and disease in animals, particularly in dogs, are similar, and how they can help each other in seeking new treatment options. Speaking of a family member with a chronic disease, my dad has a colon cancer that spread to the liver. He's doing okay now after chemotherapy and two partial liver removal surgeries. And my mom, she's pre-diabetic, so she hasn't seen the insulin yet, but she's monitoring her weight and monitoring her eating habits. So, I can already see where my health is going in 20 to 30 years, right? But it's not just me. It's everywhere. Everyone in this room is at risk at developing a chronic disease. This shows a correlation between how rich we are, how much healthcare we can afford, and how long we live. As you can see, when we get richer, we live longer, and this is worldwide. But when we get richer with a high income, we tend to die from chronic diseases with little treatment options available, rather than infectious diseases that are totally treatable. And the World Health Organization shows that the major cause of death in high-income countries are such chronic diseases, including heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, cancers, and kidney disease. These are all chronic, debilitating diseases that we do not have curable drugs yet. So, what is our pharmaceutical research doing to help us with this situation? It takes up to 12 years and up to $3 billion to create one effective drug. It takes a very long time and a lot of money. But after all this investment of time and money, overall success rate of drug development is surprisingly only 11 percent. This is a very inefficient model. Why we're doing such a poor job in drug development? What barriers do we need to break to change this model? This is a current flow of drug development, and I propose two things to break this barrier. One, to use natural disease dog models, our veterinary patients, before human clinical trials. And two, to use intestinal cell models, mini-gut, that I will explain in a second. Why we need intestinal cell model, you might ask? The vast majority of drug development is for oral medications, which get absorbed first in the intestine. Also, we know now that the intestine interacts with various organ systems in the body through the bacterial ecosystem, to the fat tissue, the liver, the intestine itself, the brain, the heart, and the lungs. This is why identifying the ideal intestinal model is important. The overall goal with these two steps is to increase the efficiency rate in drug development from that 11 percent and ultimately to decrease time and cost required in this process. The current major animal models in medical research and drug development are mice and zebrafish. They reproduce fast and ethically less challenging to genetically manipulate to induce a disease. These are powerful tools to study specific mechanism to advance science. Immortal cells from cancer cells are easy to grow in experimental setting and easy to generate data. But are these data from these models 
applicable to a complex organism like a human's body? Research says it's questionable. We need animal models and cell models that we can directly apply to humans to increase efficiency and success rate in drug development, increasing the translatability of data is critical. So, what can veterinarians do to increase the translatability? Well, when you hear veterinarians, you might think of us giving vaccines to puppies and kittens, and it is an important part of our job. But when our patients get older, we also see heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, cancers, inflammatory bowel disease, and kidney disease. These are all very similar to the chronic diseases in humans. Why can't we use our patients as a natural disease model, not an induced disease model, in drug development? Or screening process that will help our patients, particularly those who do not respond to conventional therapies, and give them a chance to try new treatment options. Also, when we talk about those chronic debilitating diseases, many research studies are looking into intestinal health to modify the outcome. Diet modification for heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, kidney disease, and even cancers. Majority of this is to modify the bacterial ecosystem in the gut, which has been shown to affect our health tremendously. Like the gut health will work as a gas pedal or brake pedal in a disease process. And when we look for translatable model for human intestinal bacterial ecosystem, we know that the dogs has much more correlation than the mice. Particularly in dogs, there's a 60% overlap with human intestinal bacteria, while in mice it is less than 20%. Intestinal bacteria affects the intestinal health. And because of these similarities, dogs' intestines are translatable model for humans. So, in our lab, we recently established intestinal stem cell model, intestinal organoids, from both healthy and diseased dogs, through a less invasive procedure using a stomach camera, an endoscopy. Healthy dogs donated their intestinal stem cells to serve as control, and those cells help us investigate a drug or diet effect without harming the actual dogs. Dogs with intestinal diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease or colon cancer donated their intestinal stem cells, and again, those cells help us investigate possible disease processes. Or appropriate treatment options, without harming or manipulating the actual patients. And I'm going to show you the intestinal organoids growing, the mini gut growing, which does not look like the intestine at all. But we have shown at the molecular level these intestinal organoids contain all the surface components of small and large intestines. And they closely mimic the structure and function of intestinal tissue. Now, we are collaborating with a bioengineer at University of Texas Austin, Dr. Hyun Jung Kim, and we are generating the very first dog gut chip. This groundbreaking technology, which is the size of a penny. And this is a penny. The actual chip is in Texas, but in this chip, with multiple small chambers, we can examine the interaction between intestinal cells, 
bacteria, and immune cells, or other types of cells, which was not possible before. Only with the true collaborative work with veterinarians, physicians, pharmacologists, and bioengineers, this work has been possible. This new tool is important because it allows us to study both humans and dogs' chronic diseases that are thought to be modulated by intestinal health. And this will help us screen the medications early in the drug development, which might decrease the number of healthy dogs that are used in toxicity testing in drug development. And one health initiative, a research to benefit both veterinary and human patients, can be accomplished as well. The Food and Drug Administration is collaborating with us now for this great potential in our research. So, if your pet or your family member or yourself get diagnosed with one of those devastating diseases, please remember that you're not alone. Sign up for clinical trials for yourself and future patients. And think about one health initiative and demand for true collaborative research and effective drug development for your health. Thank you. Sign up for clinical trials.